is going down. No, it's about five o'clock in the morning. The cars are starting to go to work. This epidemic called crack came out. So they say, here, man, just take a hit of this and it'll, it'll, it'll help you to drive, you know? And I remember standing on the street corner and I remember hearing this, just kill yourself, just run out there, just kill yourself, just kill yourself. And I was beat up really bad. I was beat up so bad I looked inhuman. Because I've been drinking all through the day, you know, and pretty much at the club we was drinking a lot. So I took one hit of it. And I said, Lord, if you're real, then you gotta do something now, right now. You're gonna do something right now. When a woman falls in love with a pimp, her life takes a turn for the worse. Hey, you know where you went? What's up, that's it, huh? Hey, what's up? Hey, 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 what's up? Put that gun down. Listen, what's the matter with you guys? You know, you violence and hate. God loves you guys. Right now, I pray for one. One of the 34 be advised, sir. No, 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 I got it. Mm. Baby. Welcome to Treasures. The prostitution business is very dangerous. Many of these pimps abuse their women, never really caring much about them, but simply wanting them for the money. A young woman from a good family named Sharon unknowingly came across a pimp one day and fell in love. Little did she know how much of a drastic turn her life would take. My name is Sharon Duncan, and I've been saved almost 24 years. I was raised in Connecticut, and I was the only black girl that went to my whole area. And so when my parents moved to California, I had a lot of, I had a lot of like problems. And the kids would tease me and call me Oreo cookie, Mary Jane, white girl. My parents, um, my dad was very influential. I was raised in a very decent home. My dad worked for Lockheed. And, um, and then my parents wind up divorcing. My name is uh, Kenneth Earl Duncan, and I'm from Sacramento, California. Now I'm a little boy, and I'm looking at this money. And he's in all silks and, you know, furs and alligator shoes, and I got holes in the bottom of mine, you know. And so, you know, those were the role models of the 60s, you know, and in, in Sacramento, those were the role models, and I said, yeah, I'm going to be like that. And I had a breakdown, and so I was really complexed out, and I was very lonely, very broken, and I met him at a party. She was a young lady, and she was a little fatuated with uh, my looks and my clothes, my car, and I guess just my character. And when I seen him, I was like, oh my God. I don't know why, I just thought he was going to be my hero. And I was working for IBM at the time when I met him. And I, I just, I, I followed him. He didn't... He told me straight up who he was, what he did. And he told me, he said, little girl, he told me that those are his exact words, little girl, you need to go home. I'm a pimp, and you don't want to mess with me. Well, pimping started in high school. I seen other guys that was older than me, and I seen how they did it. 
so, you know, I said, well, that's easy enough. So I took my girlfriend down there and uh, we got started. And he wound up driving me home that night from the party and he gave me, we exchanged numbers and I called him up and that's what happened. Uh, we got back in touch and she went there and, you know, money is uh, a very good thing to use for bait, you know. You can catch a lot of people when they get involved in something and can make instant cash like that. The first time that I actually had to do something, I remember feeling so ugly and so violated and so disvalued. I remember feeling that and I remember sitting on the corner and I was crying and I thought, what am I doing? And then I started going to jail and I picked up like six cases in less than two months. And when I went to jail, um, the last case that I caught, the, they raised my bill up to $30,000. And my dad came and he came to bail me out of jail. And he told me, he said, because Kenny had lied. At the time he told me his name was Swarman James. My father hired a private investigator, told me all this information on him. He said, look, I'm gonna get you out. You're gonna come stay with me. You're gonna travel with me because he was an engineer for Lockheed. And, you know, but I need for you to testify against him. He goes, you, I need, you need to give him, I already talked to the district attorney, but drop all the charges. This is gonna ruin your future. Your, you know, your arrest rate, you know. He went and he just started telling me all this stuff. And I looked at him. No, I can't. You're lying. I can't, I love him. What? And I told him I can't do it. I love him. I told my father, I said, I'm sorry, dad, I can't. I can't do it. You're asking me to lock this man away forever, and it was my choice. And my dad looked at me, and he said, he said, you're a bigger fool than I thought you were. And he didn't speak to me for about, probably 15 years. Yeah, probably, yeah. It, was, it wasn't until he gave his life to the world. He was devastated, I was his only daughter. He was devastated just devastated him. He could not manage it. And he didn't talk to me for a long, 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 long time. I stood with Kenny. I stood with Kenny. I loved Kenny. I can honestly say I loved him. I was in love with him. I loved him. You know, I, I loved him. I believed in his way he loved me because there was, um, he came from a good family. So it wasn't like he came from a family that was, uh, you know, abused and mis, you know, his, he was loved. His, his mother took care of him, he went to church. So it wasn't like he came from a very dysfunctional, abusive family. So he, he, didn't, he didn't carry himself in that mannerism. And it wasn't until later on when the alcohol and the drugs came in. But he was stuck on this role and he would shut down to operate in this role. And then he would open up, and that's the part that I fell in love with, is the times that he opened up. Those, those, that was a part that I fell in love with. This epidemic called crack came out. So they say, here man, just take a hit of this and it'll, it'll, it'll help you to drive, you know? Because I've been drinking all through the day, you know? And pretty much at the club, we was drinking a lot. So I took one hit of it. I lost in time. It seemed like I was there until the next day. And that's the way it was. It was such a powerful, it was such a powerful drug and such a powerful high. You know, I, I tried to keep that part of my life separated from this part of my life, you know. And uh, one of my sisters gave it to her. The sister put a crack pipe in my mouth and and that's how, I, I would never mess with drugs. I never did drugs, I never drank, I never did anything. I just went, got money, came home, went out, we partied, so on and so forth, but I never did anything until she opened up that door. And then when she opened up that door, then I started hanging out with the bad girls. 
the wild girls on the streets, and that's when I got wild. I got really, got really, before I would keep off to myself and just do what I had to do and, and go home. But then I got wild and started drinking, started stealing, started ripping people off, you know, got real crazy, got really, 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 really crazy. My worst experience out there is when this man, I got in this car on 4th Street, and this man, took me off. Do you like it like this? Stop. It, it's gonna feel good, I promise. He told me he was gonna kill me. It was only the Lord. When I look back at him, he was gonna kill me. And um, I, I don't wanna go into detail the things that I had to do, but I did some pretty crazy stuff to get out of that position and I wound up jumping out of the car. And um, that was one of the toughest times. And the other tough time, we were so paranoid and him and I had a major breakdown. We had a major falling out breakdown and uh, I went off and he went off and we got in a big old fight, a very ugly, ugly, ugly fight. And then um, I was ready to kill myself. It was, it was like four o'clock in the morning all the cars were, there's cars going down. No, it's about five o'clock in the morning. The cars are starting to go to work. And I remember standing on the street corner and I remember hearing this, just kill yourself. Just run out there. Just kill yourself. Just kill yourself. And I was beat up really bad. I was beat up so bad I looked inhuman. That's how bad I was beat up. Though it seemed like a hopeless situation, they soon found out that true hope is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that hope is an anchor for the soul. That hope gives us power that we need to move forward. Let's go back to this episode to see how Jesus intervened. getting on my hands and knees and I said Lord if you're real and if you're alive then you gotta do something then you gotta do something now right now because you're gonna do something right now and all of a sudden San Jose Police Department pulled up and they said Sharon Jones we got a warrant for your arrest and we're taking you to jail and I knew at that time God was, I didn't know what, but I knew God was doing something because my life was crazy. <laughs> and I couldn't manage it anymore. And I loved this man, but I hated my life. I hated what I did to my mom. I hated what I did to my family. I hated who I was. <laughs> I hated everything. <laughs> and I called my mom on the phone. And I said, Mama, come get me, Mama. <laughs> One more time, Mama. Because my mama, would, she would follow me all over the United States. She would even, she even follow me over to Hawaii. <laughs> my mama followed me everywhere. I was her only daughter. And I said, Mama, come get me. One more time, Mama. She goes, no, I'm not coming to get you. <laughs> and I go, Mama, please, I promise. She goes, no, I'm not coming to get you, Sharon. <laughs> and I go, why? And she goes, because I've been praying and I've been fasting and I'm on my way to a prayer meeting right now and I haven't ate nothing for 31 days and I'm believing God to change your life. And I remember I got, on, I got up and she said, so I got to go now. And I got on my hands and knees in that cell and I said, Lord, help me, God. Help me. And then all of a sudden, and this is so Odd. All of a sudden, they came up to me, the, the, the people in jail, and they go, we're going to let you out on the OR. I go, huh? They've never let me out on the OR. I've always had a bail out of jail. They go, we're going to let you get out on the OR. You're on recognizance. All you got to do is just tell boom, 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 boom. And they let me out. And then my mom, we went to the hospital, and the doctor said, 
I look deformed. If I could get that picture, I look deformed. And my doctor said, he said, we're gonna have to put a plate in your face. We're gonna, you have a triprop fracture and we're gonna have to put a plate in your face and rebuild your face. And when I went in there, I was completely healed. Completely healed by the power of God. And from that moment on, I didn't do, I never drank again. I never cussed again. I never prostituted again. I was delivered by the power of God. And that's how I got saved. And it had to be the Lord because I know the woman loved me. And she wouldn't have left me. I don't care what situation I was in. But she, when God touched her, she told me goodbye. And because I had been raised the way I was, I never tried to interfere with the Lord. And then my mom, she took, she took me and discipled me and was, she taught me and she took me to church. And then how I got into Victory Outreach was a friend of mine and I went over there and I visited the church. And when I walked into the church, Carlos from San Francisco was preaching and I felt like he was talking to me. And that's how I got into Victory Outreach. Yeah. That's how I got into Victory Outreach. And, uh, and I've been in there ever since. I tried to go to the home. I called up, I tried, I begged them to let me in. And they said, do you pray? Do you fast? Do you do this? And I go, yeah, no. So I went to Bible college and I got a degree. He came, we talked, and I told him, I remember telling him, I go, I gave my life to the Lord. And I said, I gave my life to Jesus, Kenny. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't do that anymore. And he got quiet and he didn't say anything. And then he came back down. <clears throat> and when he came back down, I talked him into going to the men's home. Well, when I got to the home, uh, I was, you know, I was still sick. But they came to Sacramento and picked me up and drug me down there in the back of a hatchback. I was laid out, and immediately the enemy attacked me. I caught on fire, Oof! I had a fever about 103, 104. And for the next three days, I burned up back there. And they never sent me to the doctor. They would bring me water, and I had no appetite, and I was just sweating, sweating, sweating. And one night, uh, Dr. Daniels and uh, Gina Cuevas, Pastor Hector's wife, and uh, Mother Jones. They used to go out on Friday nights looking for people to pray for, to heal. And so one Friday night they came to the home, they said, is anybody here sick? They said, yeah, some guy back there your daughter brought from Sacramento. And I couldn't even open my eyes. But the next day when I woke up, I was hungry. I knew something had changed then. <laughs> Cause I had no appetite at all for the last couple of months. I had no appetite, but now I am hungry. And so about a week later, I was walking around the big tent out there. You remember at the land they had the tent? I was walking around the tent. And a week later I was jogging and now I'm back lifting weights again. And you know, everything was, was, was beautiful. My mom was a warrior. She really was a warrior. And she would lay hands on me and she would pray for me and she would, you know, and she would take me into places that would do deliverances. And, but the power of God was so, was so heavy that I would just break. I remember at the hotel just breaking and wailing and sobbing and sobbing at the altar. And I mean, I would be so tore up that you know, they would just, they would just stand there and they would just, they would just pray for me and pray for me and, and they wouldn't leave me. They would stay right there at that altar and they would pray for Thank me you, and pray God, for because I was so tore up Jesus, and I was so I broken. Father, the love of the Lord and the love of God and victory outreach. There's just, there's no way, there's no way I could have ever made it, could, could have never, I could have never made it another ministry. I could have never made it because I was sold out because of the messages 
and the love. I was sold out because of what I was taught and trained and learned and discipled. I was discipled to the Lord. Now, when I went to school for alcohol addictive behavior and, and uh, I went to Sierra Pacific Bible College and graduated from there and then also through Vetti and the faculty. But I believe um, that that what I've gone through and the effects of what I've gone through, through those things, it has caused me to reach out. It has caused me to, when I see or hear or witness that happening to women, my heart is broke. You know, like I'll, I'll, I, I, I'll go into a, a weeping mode, a travail mode, if I could say. The Lord called me to pray for my pastors. He did. He called me to pray for my pastors. And every morning we would get up, there was a group of us, and we would pray from 4 to 5 or 5 to 6 o'clock in the morning. The confidence that we have is being down here in Southern California, the embracing that we have re received has been incredibly remarkable. As God began to restore Kenny and Sharon's lives, he did more than they could imagine. He restored their relationship and brought them back together. And you know, then you know, I did get married and my, my first husband passed away and I never thought it would happen. And uh, I loved him. Now she's back in her power spot, and they're having meetings. She's growing. She's loving it, and she's happy. I'm on my way, you know, with the ministry. I mean, I am. I am not starving for attention. I'm not starving for love. We enjoy each other. I enjoy him. You know, he enjoys me, and we, we have our natural issues and our natural, you know, problems like any other couple. You know, but um, I, I can honestly say that um, I love him. God is able to restore your soul, to restore your life to restore your gifts, to restore your calling, because the calling is good as long as you breathe in. I have a confidence that I've never had before. I, I'm confident, not of who I am, but of who he is and what he's done in my life. And as long as you'll call on his name, the calling of God is irrevocable to those who will receive it. I know that confidence only comes from being in a great ministry that loves God. Like Victory Outreach, Victory Outreach, this ministry enables you to be anything and everything that you could possibly be in Christ. That was amazing. I went back and was just telling my members about it. Yeah. I didn't ask them for a dime. Just told them. They said, how much do you want? And I wind up getting almost $18,000 from them to help me buy this gym. Is that a miracle or what? Miracle. So you don't mess with the power of God. Yeah, I know. That's God's power, huh? <laughs> What you have just seen is something that is happening all over the world. There's a need for us to be able to go out and begin to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. We know that we have the answer. God is able to deliver somebody and set somebody free. And here you have an example of Sharon and Kenny, how God was able to deliver them and set them free. Now you find that they were in, in heavy bondage, both of them together. But God was able to reach out to Sharon and then eventually also reach out to Kenny. And now they're in church serving the Lord. 
God has been able to take them and take that life that they have become an example to so many. There are many people that have come through Christ through their testimony. That's why I say to you today, if you're in bondage or you know someone that is living that life, we have the answer. And the answer is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. That's why when I go out to these different neighborhoods, you know, in our ministry, we have teams that go out. And we go out to those different neighborhoods, we see these women in bondage that they're actually hurting. In fact, many of them were abused when they were young. And then something happened to them and that's caused them to go out into these streets and be working the different streets and their lives totally wrecked and ruined. But we come with the positive message that we know many that have been set free. In fact, we take some of these girls that have come out of that life, and we take them right back into the neighborhood and then they're able to testify. And then we also have somebody like Kenny that used to be a pimp and he goes and he speaks to the pimps and he's able to tell them that there's, a, there's another life that they could live and how God is also able to change them. I believe God is giving to Victory Outreach a revival all over the world because we have the answer and the answer is found in the love of Jesus Christ. That's why if you find yourself in that situation today, the answer is Jesus. I wanna say a prayer for you right now. And as I say this prayer, I want you to open up your heart. Lord Jesus, right now I pray for all those that are watching this program. I pray that you reach out by your Holy Spirit and begin to touch them. Lord, you know the needs of everybody out there. And as they open up their hearts that you may come into their lives and transform them completely. What you have done for Sharon, what you've done for Kenny, do for those that are watching the program right now. In the name of Jesus, we believe you for a miracle. Now, if you've prayed that prayer with me today, you, I guarantee that the Lord has heard it, Jesus heard that prayer, and he's come into your life. Amen. Once again, we wanna just say thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today to our live broadcast. You too can also be part of giving right there where you're at, whether you're at home watching or on the go. Simply by clicking on the link in the description below or do our Victor Outreach International app. Let's take a look at how easy it is to give. Generosity made simple. Text VOI to 77977. Select the giving link. Enter your amount and gift type. If it's your first time giving, enter your payment details and confirm your gift. Thank you for your generosity. Now we can stay connected wherever you go. Download the Victory Outreach app and stay connected with Victory Outreach International. Get important updates and announcements. Learn more about our ministries. Stay connected with events, prayer requests, and more. Watch the latest video in our media section easily share content on social media within the app. Give from your phone in seconds. A convenient way to stay connected. God bless you and Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We're so excited to announce today that we're gonna be having a Christmas special taking place December the 24th, be airing at six o'clock in the evening, our Pacific Standard, Pacific Time. Standard Time. And then also Christmas Day, we're gonna be airing it periodically on Christmas Day. So I pray that you're gonna be tuned in. It's gonna be a powerful, powerful time. Yes, the glory of Christmas, and we're going all over the world with live music from all over the world, all the way from South Africa to Cuba, to the Philippines, to Europe, to, and to here South too. America too. Oh, South America. So it's going to be a tremendous time together. Yeah, so we're going to be having a special, special time. We're going to celebrate with you our Christmas, the glory of Christmas. So I pray you're going to be tuned in to glory of Christmas.